How is it that one of modern Christianity's favorite doctrines is nowhere in the Bible? And now, Garner Ted Armstrong. When disaster appears about to strike, we all want to escape. Escapism is a tremendous, powerful pull of human nature, and a lot of religious people play upon that, as do politicians and military people, and I think sometimes even some people that don't quite have all their oars in the water. I remember being on the Oprah show many years ago, and there were a couple of other people there. Why they had me there, I really have no idea. But it was because of the idea of preservation, escapism, survivability. There was a lady there who was actually raising a herd of buffalo because she said that buffalo had survived the attempts to exterminate them and they were a, a kind of a beast that survived. So she was going to have robes, clothing, and therefore something to live in and food and everything when all the great disasters struck. You've heard about the rapture. It's the most popular doctrine of organized nominal Christianity. The idea that Jesus Christ is going to come and snatch all the saints away before all horrible chaos and Pandora's box is open and everything breaks loose on the earth. Everybody knows that the Bible talks about tribulation, heavenly signs, the day of the Lord. Everybody knows we live in dangerous times. They know that you can talk endlessly about wars. I oftentimes do myself. Wars and rumors of wars, droughts, famines, disease epidemics, earthquakes, the current heat wave in Europe, 100 and what, 124, something like that over in Iraq. People want to get out. They want to escape. They want protection. They want some kind of a shield from all of this. Now, I've got something for you, three things really I want to tell you about. There are two sermons here I want to tell you. First of all, here's a booklet entitled, Heaven on Earth, question mark. You ever been to the South Island of New Zealand? You ever seen the fjords of Greenland? Have you ever been to the Swiss Alps? I have, all of those, all of the above. Have you ever seen some of the most incredible places on this earth, whether you're talking about the Rocky Mountain West or whether you're talking about places overseas, of how absolutely gorgeous and desirable, verdant, beautiful, and life-supporting is this earth of ours? Believe it or not, the Bible promises heaven on earth. Now, that'll shock you, but if you stop to think about the difference between, say, a pond and a weeping willow tree and just endless rows of solid gold mansions, if you stop to think about the difference between the natural creation that is all around us that God himself has provided and what a lot of people envision as nirvana or paradise or heaven, you ought to take a look at what the Bible actually says is going to happen at the time that Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on this earth. I've got a couple of sermons. One is entitled, A Way of Escape, and the other is entitled, The Rapture in Prophecy. And the rapture isn't there <laughs> in prophecy, and this absolutely proves it. Now, you can have both tapes. These are full one-hour sermon delivered live before an audience and the booklet, if you will dial 903-561-7070. All three are yours free of charge, absolutely no obligation, no bill to follow, not now, not ever. They're yours free. You can quote me on that. Both tapes, A Way of Escape, and of course, The Rapture, the most popular Christian doctrine in the world, in prophecy. Where do you find it in prophecy? I'm gonna go through a little bit of that right now. Uh, in just a moment. 903-561-7070 gets you all three of them. Just tell the operator this material that I'm offering today and they'll know what you mean. You know, the formula a lot of these hucksters use is pretty simple. I may have been accused a few times myself of crying wolf, wolf, but I never really have. That's just what other people might say. I know there are wars and rumors of wars. Christ said so. I know there are droughts and famines, and I know that HIV and AIDS is encroaching upon the earth. I know all about West Nile and the scares about disease epidemics. I know about the heat wave. I know about impending war against North Korea and U.S. troops now landing in Monrovia, Niger uh, I should say Liberia. I know about ongoing death in Iraq and the suicide bombers in Israel and the search for peace between these people who just can't seem to live together. 
and the rogue nations of Libya and Syria and North Korea and all the rest. So for four hours, I could scare you to death. For hours and hours and hours, I could just go back and forth and look real serious and tell you that horrible things are going to happen. And sure enough, horrible things are happening and horrible things are going to happen. And then comes the hook. And the hook is, in some of these hucksters' ideas, that if you join with them, and in some cases, it's if you give them your money, if you sell your property, and you give them all of that, and then you go with them. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Think about the hale Bop and the Kahootek Comet. Remember the guy, what was his name? I've forgotten. It was a weird-looking character from the Land of Fruits and Nuts. And... He convinced a lot of his followers that the mothership was in the tail of the, I think, the Kahootek Comet that went by. And what they were to do was to take only their driver's licenses, their California driver's licenses, and then to get in the cot or the bed. Now, this takes true grit. I mean, this is, these people were determined. How in the world you do this, I do not know. And you stop to think about the way they committed suicide. They got in those cots and they put a piece of plastic over their nose and simply lay there. And they weren't tied. They weren't handcuffed. It wasn't assisted suicide. They did it to themselves, thinking that their spirits were going to leave their body, going to take their driver's license along to prove that they're going to be able to, to drive their little what? Uh, heavenly sleds? Or, or little heavenly shooting stars or something behind the, the tail of the comet. Of course, the only trip they took was to the San Diego County morgue. But these people were so nutty, so crazed, and so who, what, who, who knows what gets into people's heads? Demon possession, maybe? I don't know how to, how to deal with that. But the desire to escape. The desire to get out of here, the desire to leave the bad guys, to leave AIDS and the crime and divorce and murder and war and drought and famine and disease and, and to go to a better place. I mean, to, to go out into space and to live, you know, a different life in the other sphere, the other dimension, was so powerful that these people committed suicide in one of the most bizarre ways you can imagine. Now, to lie there when you're strangling to death and all you got to do is reach up and take a piece of of cellophane or plastic off your nose and breathe again, but not to do it, to have that kind of willpower, it proves my point that many people are absolutely desperate for a way of escape. Now, there are all kinds of versions of a rapture. There is the great version of the rapture of the Protestant denominations of the world, and they believe, based upon three Greek words that have to do with the English word coming, and they are epiphania, that means like arrival, presence, or revealing, and parousia, that is translated coming or revealing, and apocalypsis, from which you will recognize the word apocalypse or revelation, that merely means a revealing. As you well know, the book of Revelation means a revealing, an unfolding or revealing of what is to occur in a step-by-step -step sequence of prophetic events from now on out into the future. For some reason, they chose the word parousia because obviously the word epiphania wouldn't work, the epiphany of Christ, and apocalypsis wouldn't work because they know what that means in the book of Revelation. But for the crazy reason of the word itself in the Greek language, Taking that and saying that that applies to a secret, as they used to call it, the secret rapture. They've kind of dropped that now and just call it the rapture. But that he is coming in two phases, that he is coming for his saints and later on is coming with his saints. Now, there are different interpretations, and you probably heard them all. Some think they're going to go to a desert wilderness on this earth. Others think they're going to go up to heaven for about seven years. Others think they're going to go to heaven for a thousand years and then return. All kinds of ideas. But the attraction of the idea is escapism. It is survival. It is getting away, getting out. Get, what about the poor people at 9-11? You know, when I first saw that horrible disaster, I thought maybe 40,000, 50,000 people had been uh, killed in it. 
and hadn't realized the period of time that it took after those planes struck for people to be coming down those stairwells and maybe in some few cases the elevators and getting out of there and apparently several thousand people did. If there was ever a desire, and the only footage they will show us today, they will not show the footage of a plane slamming into the buildings again. They don't want to remind us of that. And I think they should, certainly annually. But they're not going to show that because they don't want to inflame passions or anger or whatever, whatever the network's reasoning is on that. But they will show these poor people choking with dust and running as fast as they can to get away from those collapsing buildings. That is one of the most incredibly powerful desires of human nature, is to escape, get away, preserve, protect yourself, and to somehow survive. And so it's a very attractive doctrine. Now, like many so-called Christian doctrines, the doctrine itself is not found in the Bible. It is a concoction. It is an artificial concept. The word rapture you will not find, and right over there I have on another desk a great big thick blue book, and that is the exhaustive concordance. And that means that every word, and that means even little prepositions and conjunctions and 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 for and of and but and how and to and from are everywhere, wherever they are in the Bible, they are listed in that book. If the word rapture were there, it would be under R, and you could find it. It isn't there. You can't find it. Not only cannot you find it in the Bible, it isn't there doctrinally. Let me give you a couple of examples. They chose the word parousia, and here in Matthew 24, verse 27, is a prophecy of Christ that says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming the Greek word parousia, of the Son of Man be. There's an interesting little key there. Lightning doesn't always shine from the east to the west. And this is not talking about lightning as in a lightning strike in a thunderstorm. Because that can be cloud to cloud, down to up. It can be ball lightning, chain lightning. It can be all kinds of shapes. And it could come from the west to the east, from the north to the south, from top to down, from down to up. But lightning, a lightning which comes from the east to the west, there are other prophecies that show that that involves the sun. It means the rotation of the earth and that the day of the Lord and the time of the second coming of Christ is going to happen in apparently one 24-hour day. And he is coming as the sun in his strength. And as the sun shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Is that a secret event? Here is a prophecy that talks about something so brilliant, so bright, that all mankind sees it. It says, every eye shall see him. And the Greek word is parousia, which is the very word the rapturists use to try to justify their theory of Christ coming, sort of skipping off the atmosphere of the earth, gathering all the saints, taking them off up to heaven, and letting all chaos break loose, the tribulation, the heavenly sign, day of the Lord, all take place then with the saints safely ensconced in heaven, looking at it all happening down here, and not a hair of their head shall perish. When I come back, I'm going to show you some scriptures that absolutely destroy that fanciful notion. Take a look at this, and I'll be right back. How is it that one of modern Christianity's favorite doctrines, the rapture, is nowhere in the Bible? It's called the blessed hope of Christians. But is it a false hope? Call now for this free tape entitled, The Rapture in Prophecy. You'll also receive the tape, A Way of Escape, and the booklet, Heaven on Earth. Both tapes and the booklet will be mailed to you free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. You know, the lengths that some people will go to, to to attempt to prove their doctrines and to try to hoodwink their followers is just unbelievable. And I've got to show you a prime example, and I, I'll try to handle this with decorum and with a certain amount of dignity, and I will try not to speak disparagingly of any particular group or person. But there is a church who reveres a lady, long since dead, as having been a great prophetess, who wrote a book about a huge controversy involving the tug of war between Satan, the devil, and God. And in a chapter about the great controversy, she was attempting to prove from Isaiah 24 her theory 
that is called a desolate earth. Now the theory goes like this, that virtually all of mankind is going to be destroyed except the saints of that particular group who are going to be taken up to heaven and they're going to be there for 1,000 years during which the Satan, the devil, is, I guess, wandering around and seeing all this desolation and whipping himself with chains, uh, whatever. And at the end of that time, then all of the great prophecies about the kingdom of God can happen. But in the meantime, the earth is supposed to be desolate, burnt, destroyed, no one around for 1,000 years. Now here is her version. I'm going to hold it up and let you look at it of Isaiah 24, 3. This is the, the redacted version. Now, I'll show you in just a moment. You'll be absolutely shocked. So try to get a handle on this and remember what it says. Isaiah 24, 3, the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the eternal has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languishes and fades away because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, done all those wicked, evil things. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Now that sounds, as you read it, just like the Bible. Sounds like that's accurate. That's the way she copied it down. Now let's swing back over and let me show you the real version from Isaiah 24, not redacted. Here's what she saw, and here's what was really there. I will emphasize the words that she left out. It says in verse 4, after saying, The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languishes and fades away, quote, The haughty people of the earth do languish. That's people in trouble. They're, they're languishing, meaning they're hungry, they're starved, they're hurt, they're wounded, they're afflicted, but they're still there and they're still alive. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. She left all of that out. See the word fadeth away, and then because they transgressed the laws, she redacted, omitted, absolutely tore that out of the Bible and just continued on. Now, it says in verse 6, Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and notice, and they that dwell therein are desolate. She redacted that. She left it out. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, period, but there's a comma there, and few men left. The verses themselves absolutely destroy her theory, yet it is in a perfect bound book and is a part of the major doctrines of a pretty sizable church. It's this kind of thing that I've dealt with for about nearly 50 years now, of people who will deliberately twist the Word of God. They will redact it. That means to edit out, to take out major sections. They will put words in that aren't there. They will imply things that are not there. They will take doctrines that are not mentioned anywhere in the Bible and try to get you to believe them. And it's a complete false hope. Now, I don't know if there were any Christian, nominal Christians, who believed in the rapture that were in those Twin Towers on 9-11. Let's assume there were. What do you think would have gone through their minds as they were seeing some of their compatriots go to the window and jump out? What do you think would have gone through their minds if they're on the 102nd floor and they know they're trapped and they cannot get out? They have not been raptured. And surely they thought the great tribulation had occurred. I mean, their lives were right now looking at forfeiture like they're going to die in some horrible, mind-boggling way. And instead of being caught up to heaven before all of these fires and, and explosions are going on around them, there they are. You know what the Bible actually says is going to happen to the saints? Here is what Jesus Christ said, and I quote, John 16, 1, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Verse 2, They shall put you out of the synagogues. You can read churches, and that's happening. It happens all the time. Churches are breaking up, and you know, you've heard about the Episcopal Church, and it's probably going to split. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you, and Christ was talking to his own beloved disciples, whosoever killeth you will think that he does God's service. Did that happen? Well, James, the brother of John, was beheaded. Peter, tradition says, was crucified upside down. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, 
gives a list of the greatest men and women of the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Elijah, Elisha, Deborah, Barak, Ruth, all of them. Wonderful people. Their lives are there in the Bible for us to read about. They were close to God. They were righteous. And it says they wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being desolate. Sometimes they lived in caves, as did Elijah. They were people like John the Baptist, who wore a coat of camel's hair and ate wild locusts and honey. They were people of whom it says the world was not worthy. The greatest people of God. And it said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. And it says also, they were sawn asunder, as we believe may have happened to one of the prophets, that they were tortured and tormented. In other words, here's what I'm getting at. Some of those who will try to tell you that there is a, quote, place of safety, if you follow me, want to believe that the place of safety is reserved for the good guys and the tribulation is reserved for the bad guys. And the absolute proof that something is wrong with you spiritually, there's some secret part of your life, you're living a double life, something is wrong with you, is that you must have all of that sin expurgated and expunged and absolutely wrung out of you through torture. I'm telling you the truth, there are people who believe that. There are people that preach that to their followers, and they don't know what they're talking about, and that is a doctrine of Satan the devil. The greatest martyr in all of history was Jesus Christ of Nazareth himself. Was he tortured? Was he whipped and beaten within an inch of his life because there was some secret sin that had to be expunged from his body, from his mind? Of course not. He was perfect. He was flawless. He never sinned in thought, deed, or word. And he is our Savior, and he was martyred and died for our sins. James, a brother of John, wonderful young man, a wonderful disciple of Jesus Christ, yet he was beheaded. John the Baptist was beheaded. Jesus Christ said, among men that have been born of woman, there is none greater than John the Baptist. And yet he was beheaded because he stood for what he believed and what the Bible says about divorce. If you look at the great martyrs of God, whether it's Peter or Paul, who was thrown to the lions, perhaps, in the Colosseum in Rome, the greatest men and women of God in all of history ended up as martyrs for the cause of Christ, and they were not delivered, and they weren't whisked away to a place of safety, and they were not taken en masse into some kind of a rapture up to heaven above, but they were right there because they had to give a last testimony. Another great example is Stephen. And here was Saul before his conversion, holding the clothes of those who were grunting and sweating with their efforts and picking up rocks and hurling them at the unprotected head of this righteous young man who was among the diaconate and probably was among the 120 that followed Jesus Christ and was converted at Pentecost received the Holy Spirit of God, and became a prophet, and gave a great witness that you read of in the 8th and ninth chapters of the book of Acts. And here he was martyred, and in his dying statement he said, Forgive them, they know not what they do, just as his Lord and Savior had said, dying on the stake for the sins of all of mankind. There is an evil twist to a particular doctrine that some people believe. I remember a young man out of a pulpit many years ago, he learned that there had been a death where a minister had lost his wife. He didn't like that minister much, and he thought the minister was a little bit profligate and perhaps was doing some things he shouldn't, maybe hitting the beer too much, whatever. And so he, a bird as how, out of the pulpit, said this to his people, that the wife had died in order to punish the husband. It makes you wonder, now, what kind of a god is it that this guy thought that he worshipped? What kind of a God is it people worship who think that God will murder someone over here in order to break the heart of someone over there? You can't find it in the Bible. God doesn't do things like that. Get this material. I want to take another quick time out and let you get it. It is very encouraging, comforting, because there is a tremendous alternative. You don't need to worry about losing the idea of the rapture in the case that a rapture, this automobile, will not be occupied when you think about what the alternative is and what God really promises. Take a look at this, and I'll be right back.
How is it that one of modern Christianity's favorite doctrines, the rapture, is nowhere in the Bible? It's called the blessed hope of Christians. But is it a false hope? Call now for this free tape entitled, The Rapture in Prophecy. You'll also receive the tape, A Way of Escape, and the booklet, Heaven on Earth. Both tapes and the booklet will be mailed to you free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. You need to understand the purpose for the church in the first place. What is a church? Christ said, I will build my church. The Greek word is ekklesia. And it is a plural word, just like group or family or lodge or what have you. And really the word is assembly, a group of called out ones to whom he gave a great commission. And he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore into all the world and preach the good news unto every creature. Now for, well, almost 2,000 years, I was going to say thousands of years, 2,000 years, people have revered, adored, and worshipped Christ, Jesus Christ. They, they believe in his name. They believe in Jesus. They talk about the little Lord Jesus away in a manger. They talk about Jesus overshadowed by Mary. They show La Pieta, the, the statuary in Rome of a dead Christ on a cross. They adore him. They worship him. They love him. They say, isn't it nice to know the Lord? But they have rejected and set aside and ignored his message. He was a messenger. He brought a powerful message, and it was about government. It was about a coming world ruling government. It was not about a smarmy, sticky, sentimental, namby-pamby, lovey-dovey message about just love your neighbor and turn the other cheek. It also had to do with solving the problems of Iraq, Iran, Libya, North Korea, the United States, all of Africa, Central and South America, the whole world, and solving the problems of mankind. It is a message of a coming future super world ruling government of which Christ is the king. The kingdom of God was his message, and a kingdom is only a kingdom when it has a king, subjects, territory, and laws by which those subjects are ruled. And the Bible clearly says Christ is coming again to make war, and he is going to conquer the beast power and fighting warring nations of this earth and bring it peace at last forcibly because he's going to use super weapons that the world has never seen before. Now you can get all of that when you get this material, because the alternative is not us furtively going away while millions of others die horrible deaths and us sit up there in heavenly armchairs watching them die. It has to do with an active group of people who are doing a work of witness and warning and then what happens next. Get this material, heaven on earth, question mark, and the two tapes, a way of escape and the rapture in prophecy. They're free of charge if you dial 903-561-7070. That's 903-561-7070. Tell your friends and neighbors where they can see the program, and I'll see you here in one week. Call now for this free tape entitled, The Rapture in Prophecy. You'll also receive the tape, A Way of Escape, and the booklet, Heaven on Earth. Both tapes and the booklet will be mailed to you free of charge when you call 903-561-7070.